Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa podcast. And remember, the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network is brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. We are here on this Wednesday, a day before the Masters. Uh, and again, you know how much I look forward to the Masters every year. Uh, one of the great sporting events. And the Masters hits this year uh, at a very, very important time and a, a needy time for golf. Because golf right now, it needs the Masters. It needs a dramatic Sunday with a classic leaderboard. It needs a tournament with all the best players in the world in the tournament and not this divided nonsense that we get now from the PGA and Liv, although I, I never watch uh, Liv. And I'll tell you, I ha except for the players, I haven't watched a lot of the uh, PGA. I, I just I don't find it compelling. And I'm, I'm a big Scotty Scheffler fan. I like him. Um, I got lucky with him early in his run a couple of times, wagering on him. He came from behind a couple of times with really dramatic wins. Um, and, you know, I saw as Mickelson faded and needed somebody to root for, he's an easy guy to root for. Now, uh, we'll get to his status here. But more imp importantly right now, this is a, an incredibly important tournament for golf. And that golf puts its best foot forward. Not that there's going to be any battles or any, uh, you know, any bad feelings between the live guys and the PGA guys. I'm not looking for any of that. We haven't seen any of that in the past. So I'm not, I'm not expecting that. But golf needs an event. It needs an event that people can wrap their, their arms around. It needs some excitement where people are interested in the players. And here you have storylines and you have all the big players involved. I mean, you even have Tiger Woods storylines here this week. So the Masters right now is doing what the Masters does. It puts golf's best foot forward always. And it is a usually a dramatic uh, and a sporting event that we anticipate and look forward to as one of the real annual rites of spring. Now, there's four storylines here other than the obvious PGA house divided live story. Number one, the biggest story, unfortunately, and this is a real negative, is the weather. It looks like there is a, you know, just terrible storm headed towards Augusta. And it sounds like there's a exceedingly strong chance that tomorrow's uh, round could be either delayed significantly or canceled because they're talking about 45 mile an hour winds and heavy, heavy rains hitting tomorrow morning. Now, I can tell you from being there, there is not a place in the world you want to be less in bad weather than the Masters. It turns into a mud bowl. I went to a Masters. One of the times I've been there, and I've been there for two different Masters, one of the ones I went to was a rare cancellation of the Thursday round. So I went out Friday morning real early because these guys were going to try and play 36. You know, usually about half the field winds up finishing. The other half finishes on Saturday morning. That will also kill some of the older players because the course is very hard on their legs. And very What people don't realize who've never been to the Masters, it is extremely hilly. But I decided on that morning to follow Fred Couples, who I know fairly well and know through the years because of my relationship with Jim Nance. And um, Freddie and I had become friendly, and uh, so I followed him. And the clothes I was wearing, and I didn't have shorts on because it was kind of chilly, were ruined. I, I mean, I couldn't even clean them. I mean, there was so much mud caked on my pants and on my shoes, and it, you were up to your knees in mud. And the rain had stopped. 
This was just what was left over. It was just areas that should have been pristine and just beautifully manicured grass were mud. I mean, and you walked up to mud where you were on the side, obviously, as you know, you're outside the ropes. You're walking in mud that is, uh, I can't even explain it. So the fact that you're going to get bad weather does a lot of things. It hampers the tournament dramatically. I think a lot of the older players, anybody trying to do something as an older player, I mean, I think anybody over 40 who goes out and has to play 36 there is, is compromised dramatically because it's just tiring. So weather's going to play a factor, especially early in the tournament, unfortunately. And every year after my master's experience, I look to see what the weather's going to be. And this year, it looks like it's going to start off. And instead of sitting down and watching, you know, uh, Rory with Scheffler and Shoffley as the morning group, or Phil who's out at 9, or those guys who are out at 10, and just watching them all morning, uh, I'm not sure you're going to get any golf early. I'm, they say you'll get golf tomorrow, but it may be late in the afternoon before you get it. Number two, we have not since the days, the halcyon days of Tiger Woods, the brilliant days of Tiger Woods, have we had a champion come in here as dominant as Scotty Scheffler has been. Now, the one proviso you would say, to be fair, is he has been doing it against a field that is nowhere near as good as this field because now, you know, Rom's here, Kepka's here, Dustin Johnson's here, DeChambeau is here, and on and on and on and on. All the live guys are here. So it's a much better group than he's been beating, but he has been not beating, he has been dominating. And the bigger surprise will be, the bigger surprise will be if he's not on the leaderboard on Saturday. That will be the shock. Almost everybody says either one or two things. I'm picking Scotty Scheffler or I'm picking Scotty Scheffler and I'm not wagering on him because he's only four to one and that's an outrageous price. Now, from a gambling standpoint, you're not betting on Scotty Scheffler four to one to win the Masters. That's just, you know, you want to, you want 10 to one on anybody winning the Masters. I'm sorry. Except Tiger Woods in his, in his prime. And even that, you want a good price. But four to one, when the next guy is 11 to one, that's Rory, 12 to one, uh, Rom. Rom's a good price, 12 to 1. Scotty Scheffler's a terrible price of 4 to 1. Do I think Scotty Scheffler's going to be on the leaderboard on Sunday? Absolutely. Would I make him the favorite to win it? Yes. Would I bet on him? Absolutely not. But he is clearly the dominant player, and we all expect him to play well. The next storyline is Tiger Woods. Tiger went out and evidently shot a good practice round, a very, very good front nine, and has everybody excited, and Tiger makes the statement, I, you know what, I, I think I can win this. Well, we would all love to see a Sunday at the Masters with Tiger Woods on the leaderboard, okay? I mean, golf couldn't have anything better than to wake up on Sunday morning and have Tiger Woods on the leaderboard or within a couple of strokes of the lead, that would be, the ratings would be through the roof. And they need that. I personally don't think he can do it. Now, I think Tiger Woods can go out and shoot around the golf, especially at Augusta, which he knows every nook and cranny. And as Jack Nicholas proclaimed, hey, if you can hit six shots, and he listed them, you know, the drive at two, the drive, at, the, the, the tee shot at, at 12, you know, the second shot at 15. He, said, he listed the six shots. If you can hit these six shots well, you can have a great score. Tiger Woods knows this course like the back of his hand, and he's still Tiger Woods. He could have a great round. He can't have four great rounds because he just can't last physically. And if he has to play more than 18 holes on any given day, he's dead. There's no way he can do that. 
hey, here's what I noticed about Tiger. Even if he walks around and plays well and, and shoots a, a sub-70 round on Thursday, he'll be limping on Friday. His back will hurt. His knees will hurt. That's just what we see every time he plays. Do I think he could put four rounds together back to back to back to back? Do I think he could walk that course on a soft, soggy day after it takes an inch and a half or two inches of rain? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'd love to see it, but I don't think he can do it. So do I think Tiger Woods can win? No. If he was in the top 20, I'd be amazed. And I think he can make the cut because the rounds get harder for him as the days go by because he can't play four days in a row. And the other storyline is the same one. And to me, it's tedious because I'm not the biggest Rory guy. But these guys all keep picking Rory. And they've been doing it now for going on nine years of majors without him winning a tournament. Oh, he's going to finally complete the Grand Slam with the Augusta. This is the year. This is the year. I just got out, I got out of the car and somebody was saying this is the year. I drove half to the school and I, was, I got back and I was listening to Masters Radio. And, oh, this is the year. This is the year. I've been hearing that every year. Every tournament you hear that about Roy. He's finally got his putting under control. He went and talked to Butch Harmon. He went and did the, hey, I got to see it. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. I've been watching it not come true for nine years. I, 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 don't, I don't need to see anymore. I was convinced years and years ago. Something always goes wrong in this game. So I wouldn't go near him. But he's a storyline. So you have that golf needs this dramatically. You have the weather, unfortunately. You have the dominance of Scheffler. You have the presence of Tiger, who is 150 to 1 to win the tournament. The better bet is does Tiger make them, you know, does he make the cut? And then Phil is an example is 100 to 1. And remember, Phil finished second last year. He's tied for second. And his record at Augusta is unbelievable. So even though he's not playing well, I always say, hey, Phil at Augusta, be careful. He loves the place and he plays great there. And then you got Rory. Now, as I told you, you put a gun to my head and ask you who's going to win, I'm going to tell you Scheffler. I expect him to be on the board on Sunday. I wouldn't bet him. Only way I bet Scheffler is if he gets off to a slow start and then I see some, see him catching fire on Friday or Saturday, late Friday or early Saturday and I put a wager in on him. I got three win wages because of the prices. And I'll give you a top five wager and I'll give you a top ten wager. Here we go. Number one, my uh, first winner at 35 to one is Zalatoris. Loves the course. Back is better, is made for the Masters, and I think he'll play really well here. He's already played well here. I think he'll play well here. He's 35 to 1. He's 7 to 1 to finish in the top five, which is a good odds. Uh, I think he can win the tournament at 35 to 1. My second guy has had a bad year, but the idea that you can tell me that this guy is not one of the five or six best players in the world is utter nonsense. And right now, the odds are telling you that he isn't even a top 15 player, and that's Victor Hovland. What, has everybody forgot about Victor Hovland? Victor Hovland, I'm sorry, is one of the five or six best players in the world. He's just not played well yet this year. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen in Augusta. And everyone will say, oh, man, I forgot about Victor Hovland. But Victor Hovland is one of the most talented players in the world. He's 33 to 1. I'm betting on him, too. He's 7 to 1 to finish in the top five. Another generous one. And then my third one is my major guy that I've had so much success with. And I, I just, I can't not go when he's in a major, and that's Kepka. And you're getting 20 to 1 with Kepka, and that's great odds. If you get Kepka 20 to 1 in a major, you have to take it. Why? Because he dominates in the majors. And he's never won a green jacket, and he wants one. He's finished second twice. And he's 20 to 1. Listen, there's only four guys under 20 to 1. So Zalator is 35 to 1. 
Hovland thirty three to one, and Kepka twenty to one. And those guys at seven to one at, for top five are still good wages too. Now top five, I'm going to give you Cameron Smith at eight to one. Loves the putt Augusta, dangerous player. Has a habit of coming on as the Masters goes on. All of a sudden, you see him appear, and all of a sudden, he's an issue. Uh, like Cameron Smith at eight to one, and then at ten to one, I'm taking Phil at fourteen to one. I'm sorry to finish in the top ten. Why? Because he always finishes in the top ten. I mean, the guy's numbers at Augusta are staggering, staggering. I mean. I, I play in these Masters pools, especially one really intricate pool, which is a great pool. And so before the Masters starts, I go through and review how everybody plays. You know, you go to the Masters app and you go through all the different guys and see how – because if you play well at Augusta, you play well at Augusta. That's, that's basically the bottom line. And Augusta makes it easy for you because they break everything down. Now, Phil Mickelson at Augusta. Okay. I mean, sometimes, here you go. He's won it three times, four, six, and 10. He's been in the, he's gone, he's played in Augusta 30 times. He's made the cut 27 times. Rounds under par. Most guys have, some good players have 10, 15. He has 60 rounds on the par. 60 rounds on the par. That is just scary. Making his 31, 31st mass appearance, shot a final round 65 last year to be tied for a runner up. Both records for a player 50 or older. One of at least eight to win the Masters three times. He's finished in the top five at Augusta 12 different times. I mean, his numbers at Augusta are staggering. I'm sorry, and he was second last year. I know he hasn't played worth a damn this year, but you know what? I don't know what his motivation is out there on the tour. On live, I have no idea. I don't watch it. I have no idea. But if I can get fourteen to one on Phil, I didn't take him to win, even though he's two hundred to one. And it's tempting, but I don't think he wins the tournament at his age. But do I think he can finish in the top ten? Yes. And you're getting fourteen to one for him to finish in the top ten. That's pretty darn good. You know, golf is an incredibly good, it's like horse racing. Horse racing is an incredible betting sport because you get great value for your dollar. You're not betting even money like you're on sports or laying 110 or laying 120 on every bet. That weighs you down. What kills you in sports betting is the VIG. You have to fit 55% to break even. If you notice, like on an NFL game, they don't take the game up to three and a half. They leave it at three, but they'll put the game at three minus 130. They're getting a 30% breakage on a game. That's a, That always gets me because it's an obscene bet. Just because you don't want to raise the game to three and a half, I got to pay, you know, 130, 140 on the bet? No, thank you. Because those bets will just destroy you over a long period of time. If you, you know, it, it just it, they're hard to overcome. Um, but golf, you're getting a big, you know, you get a guy at thirty-five to one. I mean, that's that was a generous odds. Thirty to one, twenty to one. Now. It's not easy to, you know, pick a winner in, in golf, just like in horse racing. But when you do, like last year, when I picked Derby, when he paid thirty-one sixty, I mean, for two dollars, you're getting thirty-one sixty. That's value.
So that's why I can't play Scheffler. Scheffler, but hey, Scheffler's great. I mean, he is, and he is on such a tear this year. He has dominated. I understand he's not dominating the full field. That's a fair thing to bring up. But he's the best player in the world right now. I say Rom second. He's the best player in the world by a, a solid margin right now, the way he's playing. Now, remember, during each round of the Masters, Bet Rivers is offering live betting specials. So visit the Bet Rivers app for full details and discover what bonus awaits each day during the tournament. So they're going to have special bonus wages that they'll pop up during the day on the Bet Rivers app during the Masters. So they might say, um, You know, hit these three guys, these three guys finish in the top 30 and you get this. Or these three guys finish in the top 20 and you get this. Or two out of three do this and you get this. I mean, that kind of thing. So that'll be there for you. Bonus wages, bonus things to play with, bonus betting specials each day during the Masters on the Bet Rivers app. So check it out. Bet Rivers. The Bet Rivers app is uh, always, always improving itself, always getting better, always getting more interesting. So check it out. You know, a couple of things, a couple of things other than the Masters for just a minute. You know, I saw um, a couple of guys, and listen, People have relationships in sports. You might be a talking head or you might be a ex-coach or something, and you might have a relationship with a certain guy and you don't don't want to bury him or something. But listen, let's be honest. John Calipari jumped to Arkansas because he found a new place where he can be loved again and still make a ton of money. And still have a chance to win. That was all gone in Kentucky. They didn't like him anymore. When he got there in his early years, they loved him. Now they can't stand him. They wanted him out. He didn't get along with the AD. The AD wanted him out. The AD wanted him to do things differently the last couple of years, not be so reliant on freshmen. Okay? That's the way he played. I mean, look how many good pros he sent, but it's not about sending guys to the pros. And people have a habit of viewing the NCAA tournament in a completely warped manner. Like there was a lot of talk the other night about how good UConn is in perspective. And people are giving me other teams and saying, they beat this guy in this round. They beat that guy in this round. They beat that guy. in this. But they're judging them on their pro career eight years later. That doesn't have anything to do with the team they were on. The fact that you beat Shaquille O'Neal when, on your way to a tournament, Shaquille O'Neal's team stunk in the NCAA tournament. They never did anything. Charles Barkley's teams never did anything. The great Tim Duncan's teams never got anywhere. So you can't judge them on them becoming NBA superstars and then say, oh, they went back and beat this team. You know, I'm talking about, oh, look, they, you know, they beat this great North Carolina team. Yeah, that North Carolina team lost to an Indiana team a year later that didn't have one-tenth the talent that Carolina had, and they beat him, Indiana beat him in the regional. Why? Because they were a college basketball team that was well-coached and knew how to play. Whether you like it or not, all you can do is dominate your opponents at the time you play them. And don't think you can tell me which one's a better college team. And you can't go back and base it on whether or not they had a guy who was a great pro. Because that doesn't make any, has anything to do with what they were when they were collegians. And the team they were on. Just because they had a named player 
a perfect example. The LSU team had Abdul Rauf, you know, who was a great college guard, Stanley Roberts, and Shaquille, and couldn't even get out of the regional. So if you think, oh, I beat Shaquille O'Neal, well, in college, it didn't matter. They weren't any good. Because it's about playing as a unit. It's about playing as a team. The Walton gang were a great basketball team. Yes, Bill Walton was a great player, but they were a great basketball team. The the Lou Alcinda UCLA team was a well-oiled machine. Yes, he was completely dominant as a player. And the difference between his 37 points in a championship game and Edie's 37 points in a championship game, night and day. Let's be fair here. And I'm not trying to detract from Edie, but Edie got a lot of those points in garbage time in the bulk of that game. He, Edie played a brilliant first five minutes. I thought his first five minutes on both ends of the floor were off the charts. I mean, I thought I was going to look at an immortal performance that night. From that point, from the 10-minute mark of the first half to the 10-minute mark of the second half, Edie played terribly. He got pushed around. He looked tired. He shot air balls. He missed shots he should have made. He had guys dunking over him. I mean, he looked terrible. Yes, he wound up with 37 points, and I'm not detracting from his talent. But a lot of those points came when that game was over. He did not. In the Tennessee game, he dominated the game from start to finish. He was the focal point of every minute of that game. He was the reason they won. In the UConn game, he was rendered ineffective for 20 minutes of that game. And until that game was over, he hadn't done anything in a long time. And then he scored a bunch of points at the end. Listen, I'm not trying to bury the Purdue coach, but his game plan made no sense. I saw two Big Ten game plans against UConn that made no sense. Illinois made no sense, and Purdue's made no sense. How do you not have your players go out and shoot threes? And if you don't know how to get threes out of your offense, it just shows you how rudimentary their offense is. These Big East teams, what Patino did against UConn, what Creighton did against UConn, What Seton Hall did against Utah shows coaching and it shows a brightness about how to play them. What Alabama did about you again against UConn and Alabama played them much better than anybody in the tournament. They just didn't have any size that could combat them inside. So when they're, when they finally got down to realistic shooting and they shot 11 of 23 from three, which is great, but they were eight of 11 in the first half, which is insane. But Alabama had a game plan and it worked. They ran out of gas and they didn't have any size. Yes, the athleticism and the size and the quickness of the perimeter players at UConn completely destroyed what Purdue does. They couldn't handle them. They couldn't handle them in the lane. They couldn't handle them off the glass. They couldn't handle their quickness. They couldn't handle their quick jumping ability or their defensive ability. And the UConn game plan was brilliant. They didn't care if they got twos. They just weren't giving them any threes. They didn't leave the three guys open. But Purdue needed a one of the brilliant coaches told you at halftime what Purdue had to do. The guards had to, instead of go in the paint where they're not comfortable and shoot twos, they had to slide and move along the three-point line and get threes. And they never, ever did that. They got one three in the game.
It can't work. That's why the closest you saw anybody play them in score down the stretch of the season was St. John's. And St. John's did two things. I was at that game. They never going to win that game, but they annoyed UConn. They turned them over in the press in the last five minutes, and they made some threes. And they lost by five. Creighton, the last team to beat them. Now, Seton Hall beat them not at full strength, so I'm not going to count the game. I'm not knocking Seton Hall at all. You know, I, I, I yeah, have great respect for Seton Hall, but they did beat him without Klingon. Creighton beat him at full strength and beat him easy. Why? Because they went crazy from three, which is what Creighton does. I didn't understand the Big Ten game plans against them. I just didn't understand it at all. But I think there's a warped look at how people judge. You cannot judge a college team and its strength as a basketball team by whether or not they had a star guy who became a big pro. Because that didn't... I'm telling you, Indiana, with no guys who became good pros, beat the great North Carolina team in the regional semifinal. How? They played better as a team, which is what it is about in the tournament. It's not about their pro potential. So saying, oh, they went through Tim Duncan and they went through this guy and they went through that guy because those guys became good pros is nonsense. That's nothing to do with what they, how strong they were as teams. And I'm telling you, this team ran roughshod on the NCAA tournament more dominantly than any team I've seen since the UCLA days. And that's a fact. UNLV, the year after, they won the championship by destroying Duke on Monday night. They lost to Duke in the semifinals when Greg Anthony fouled out. Nobody dominated teams the way this team dominated teams. Does that make them the greatest team of all time? No, but they you can say from a historical fact that they dominated their opposition on a level that has not been seen since the way UCLA dominated. And yes, Kentucky, 96, had a lot of pros, was a great team, and didn't have, didn't have Okay, a lot of opposition in that tournament. Despite the fact you're going to give me names, it doesn't matter. That was a very good team, but they didn't win back-to-back championships. So how are you going to compare them to Connecticut? They went back-to-back championships doing this. You got to start with the teams that went back-to-back because if you didn't win back-to-back, you're off the chart. You can't be in this conversation. You didn't win back-to-back. So you're starting with the teams that won back-to-back, and then you look at them. Don't win me one-year wins, because one-year wins doesn't cut it. You didn't win back-to-back. Why? Because your whole team left. Well, tough luck. You know, a lot of their team left last year. They changed guys. They didn't have Spencer. They didn't have Castle. The guy who was the MVP last year wasn't there this year. You got to look at it fairly and just look at it in terms of how they dominated their opposition. If you try to judge how good their opposition is as teams, and then all you're doing is looking at it based on the fact that you had a guy in there who became a good pro, that's not the way it works. Because Shaquille became one of the dominant pros of all time, and he didn't do anything in the NCAA tournament. I never thought Hurley, I told you, would have any interest on a a wide range of levels for that job. Never. I did think that 
Billy Donovan, would, and I don't know how Billy feels about the NBA or anything else. I did think he would at least sit down and take a real thought about that job. And maybe he still will. I don't know. He's the right guy for the job. You have to be a certain type to be there. He's the right guy for that job. I don't know if they can get him. If not, they'll settle for some college coach. That's all. And so be it. And Calipari will win at Arkansas because he's great at getting players. He's great at building a program from scratch. Great at it. You know, I was watching Brunson last night. I turned on that Nick Bull game. And, you know, Brunson's been on this tear. He's basically his last four games, he's averaged 40 points. 35, 35, 43, 45. So he's averaged like, you know, one tick below 40 for the last four games. And I thought about How many pros can you think of who started, and I loved him in college, and I I have to admit, a lot of guys didn't think he'd play well in the pros at all. I thought he would be a good rotation player, probably as a backup point guard. I thought he'd be a a nice 20-minute-a-night player. First year, he's that. You know, he averaged nine points. Second year, he averaged eight points. Third year, he averaged 12 points. Then he got minutes and he averages 16 points. Then he goes to 24 points. And now this year, he goes to 28 3. 28 3, seven assists. Those are big numbers. You start off your career and you're averaging, coming off the bench averaging nine points a game, then eight points a game, and the next thing you know, you're averaging 28 points a game. And you now he's going from a bench player to a guy who's going to be all NBA. Now, I don't think he'll be first team. I think he'll be second team. But being second team is the top 10 players in the league. It's a hell of a deal. What an amazing, amazing transformation as a player. To now, he's a, not just a legitimate star, he's now bordering and is even breaking through being a superstar. Now, he obviously needs to do it in the playoffs, and in the playoffs, it's going to be more difficult. Because you now, instead of playing a team that's passing by one night, you're playing a team that is dedicating scouting reports and a whole regimen of defense and defensive adjustments, secondary adjustments, adjustments after the first game played in the series. And they will do everything to stop his scoring. And they're going to get the ball out of his hands and they're going to double team him. They're going to play him with bigger players. They're going to shade him with bigger players, and they are going to double him with bigger players. And they're going to make somebody else in the next beat them. I like the Nick chemistry, cohesiveness. I like what Hart brings. I like what OG brings. They need a healthy OG. They need a healthy Robinson because of his offensive rebounding and his rim protection. But the Randall loss is not a loss to me. I think they can play better without him because that's the way basketball is. Sometimes less is more. You define roles better. You have better chemistry. And it leads to higher productivity for the unit, which is what it's about, the unit. People forget in basketball, it's not about just bringing in a guy more means more. More sometimes means less. Often means less. Their chemistry right now, their defense, their chemistry, what OG brings is exquisite. It really is. It's really fun to watch. Can't wait for the playoffs. I don't know if Giannis got hurt badly last night. I know he had an injury in space, which is always very dangerous, meaning no collision or anything else. When guys do that, that's usually a danger sign. They're saying it wasn't 
a knee. It wasn't an Achilles. It was it was a calf injury. But hey, if it's a calf pull, those are a pain in the neck. They can take a month. So we'll have to wait and see how that impacts their status. And they have not, although they won last night, they have not been playing well. Yankees went to 10 wins last night. Dodgers have 10 wins. They played a couple extra games. Yankees are 10 and 2. They're off to a very good start. They are patient in their bats. They have length now in their lineup. They have balance in their lineup. Uh, Two things that that lineup has lacked since the great days. Balance and length. They have both back. Very good to see. I still worry about the depth of the rotation. I still worry about the back of the bullpen. Um, If you think the Yankees aren't going to have a rough day this year ever, I think that's crazy. But they're off to a good start. They've got a good cushion, and that's not a bad thing. A 10-2 and start's a nice way to go. And the Marlins are just, I mean, not only are they off to a terrible start, but their approach is like little leaguers. It's scary. Not good. After overachieving last year, not good. I know they've had injuries, but man, man, man. Not good. And the Mets have showed life. They won game one coming from 4 nothing down. Last night, they were down big, and they came back and almost they put a big scare into them. Almost, you know, did something noteworthy. But at least they're showing some life as they go through this uh, Atlanta series, one up, one down so far. We'll see where the last two games take them. We will give you wall-to-wall coverage. We'll do master stuff every day. We'll preview it. We'll review it. You know, along the way, we'll chronicle certain guys. You know, you look at it every day. There's so many things. If you like to wager on golf, there's so many things to wager on, not just Winner of the tournament, not just top five, top seven. You have, they put these groups together. Like these five players, what are the odds for this guy to beat this group? Now, usually the biggest odds you're going to get on a decent player is four to one. But the point is four to one against five guys is pretty good. You have that. You also have the head-to-head matchups, which they put up each day. And you can bet to win the tournament when a guy gets off to a shaky start and now he's way down the list. Doesn't mean he can't come back. Doesn't mean he can't make up 10 strokes over three days. It really is about who it is, though, before you do that. Because in my mind, it takes a certain level of play. It takes a certain level of stardom and talent and expertise and experience to win the Masters. Unknowns don't win the Masters because they don't survive the pressures of Saturday and the challenges of Sunday. The weight of getting through that round has made Great players blink. It made Kepka blink last year. You've seen guys come to number 12 playing dominantly. Molinari a couple of years ago, he couldn't do anything wrong. He hadn't had a bogey in forever. He couldn't do, it was like a machine. He came there, he misread the wind, he put the ball in the water and he was gone. You hit the ball in the wrong, you, you don't judge the win right on 12. You don't put the ball in the right spot on 13. You try and hit too aggressive a shot on 15, you're gone. While somebody else nails it, puts an eagle putt 12 feet away, drains it. Now they just picked up two shots and the battle is joined, as Ben Wright would say. And talking about announcers, Vern Lundquist 
has been a uh, prominent voice forever in in sports. You remember Vern, obviously from from football. And the joke has always been that Vern always gets the moment. And how many moments has he had at the Masters? To give you that patented, yes, sir. Um, He has had so many. And he is a guy that, you know, the audience loves. Because, you know, a guy gets there. It's the same voice, the same guy, on the same hole, sometimes for 20 years. And that is the magic of the Masters, you know. Not only because they do things differently. And there is in a, this is the right way appeal. And in a not offensive way, their snobbish attitude, and they are snobs, let's be honest. They think they're better than anybody else, and they are. And usually it's the master's way or it's the highway, because they don't care about, and that's, they are selling, but they're selling from such a position of strength, they don't have to act like they're selling. See, they act like money doesn't count, but they have the biggest, biggest souvenir place you've ever seen, and it is packed. And you would think, oh, that mess doesn't care about that. You know, they charge a dollar for a sandwich. They do. And they watch your stuff for nothing. They do. Because they think that's right. But they also have a souvenir place where you, I mean, you know, the Yankees sell a lot of stuff. I mean, you look at a ball game. The Yankees, their merchandising is crazy. I mean, think about it. You see Yankee hats everywhere in the world. You turn on a Yankee game, 80 to 90% of that crowd has got on a Yankee jersey, a Yankee sweatshirt, a Yankee jacket, and, you know, 60% of them have on Yankee uh, hats. And that's not all their stuff. That's their Thursday stuff. Or their Friday stuff. Remember, yeah, they haven't, you know, they haven't brought out their Saturday stuff. That same thing with Augusta. People go in there and buy Christmas presents. They have lists. I, I've been in that store, and there's people with lists, and they're like, "What are you doing?" Well, these are my Christmas lists. I get everybody in Augusta, <laughs> and, and they'll ship them, and you know, they sell them ornament for the tree. They sell them by the you know gazillions. So they are a well-oiled machine in every way. And, you know, they curtail the commercials, which is a brilliant approach. Brilliant. But you have to be the masters to get away with that. And they get away with everything because they're the masters. And the places run like a top. Like if you you try to get unruly there, one of the guys who's there, who's working, unassuming older gentleman, all he does is put up a paddle and you're escorted out of the building. They don't ask questions. They take your credential or your ticket and they throw you out in the street. <laughs> That's basically it. You're gone. You can't say, well, I'm sorry I did this. When they tell you don't walk on that piece of grass go around and you say, hey, buddy, I'll walk all over. You get three feet on that grass and you will be out of the building. And that's how they run the place. You can leave a chair for an hour and a half and go somewhere and come back and there'll be nobody sitting in your chair. Not a chance. They just don't do that. So is it different? Yes, it's different. It's like it goes back in time. But you know what? Some of the things that have the most charm do go back in time. Saratoga is like turning the corner and going back 200 years, as Red Smith said. The mass is the same way. You go in there and it's 1950, and Arnie's there. And they have silly stuff like how you can't say certain things. 
They've taken announcers off the broadcast for making certain comments, like saying the Greens were so fast they were bikini waxed. Goodbye. Calling it a crowd or a horde or whatever it was called instead of calling it patrons. Goodbye. Silly stuff, obnoxious stuff. And, you know, they've taken a million hits about not having certain types of members. We know we know all that stuff, okay? I'm sorry, the masses isn't for everybody. And if I can't get in the club, I can't get in the club. So I'm not worried about anybody else getting in the club. I couldn't get in the club either. You can't get in the club. I can't get in the club. That club is for, you know, captains of industry. You're the chairman of the board of some big company. You can get there. You're a senator or, you know, or you ran for president or you were an ex-president. You can go there. That's the way it works. So what? what? Don't, that, you can't let that detract from the event because you can't belong there. There's a lot of clubs you can't belong to. A lot of clubs I can't belong to. So who cares? But what makes it special is you go back there every year for four days. And as a fan, you know every, if you're a real golf fan, you know every nook and cranny of the place. And there's no other golf tournament where you have any idea other than, say, Pebble Beach, which you've seen and it's ingrained in your mind. There are very few golf courses where you know anything about the holes. You need them to tell you about the hole, and you still don't grasp it because you can't know a hole by seeing it once or twice. You have to watch it be played year after year, and you have to understand how it's played. And it's even different if you go there, I can tell you. Now, listen, going there is not easy. It's incredibly hard to get tickets. It's very expensive to go there. I mean, it's all true. But it is a, you know, any big sport is expensive to go to the Super Bowl. But if you go there, you'll see that it's very different than you even think it is. First of all, it's dramatically more hilly than you ever thought. But you know the place so well, which is what leads to your appreciation. And then you put an announcer on a hole for the last 30 or 40 years like Vern, and he's become really renowned with that piece of real estate. And with all the great shots and moments that have come his way, from Jack to Tiger, etc. Well, I bring Vern up because... A, I've known Vern for many, many years because, you know, he was at CBS all the years I was at CBS. And he was a great guy. Great guy. Always was. N wonderfully nice man. Terrific broadcaster. And a guy who was always in the right place at the right time. He's calling it quits after this year. And I'm sure they'll honor him in some way this week. Jim will do a great job with that. Uh, and he deserves that. But it won't be the same. But hey, you know, you move on. And new people take over, and that's just the way it is. And nobody's going to do an event forever. It doesn't work that way. But we have all that starting tomorrow, and, you know, you get all pumped up for it tomorrow morning, and then you get five hours of rain. But hey, nobody can do anything about the weather. So we'll see how that works out. We will have coverage every day. And remember, during each round of the Masters, Bet Rivers is offering live betting specials. Visit the Bet Rivers app for full details and discover what bonus awaits each day of the tournament. They have all little special offerings for you, values for you, presents for you. So check it out. Go to the Bet Rivers app and download it, and you'll be ready to have your Masters fun. Enjoy. We'll talk to you tomorrow.